Uh, I wasn't really sure exactly what an invited talk was when I very graciously accepted Doug's invitation to give one. And then um, about an hour or two ago, I looked at the, um, the schedule and I realized that I was actually on the docket to present something. And it looked like it was two hours long, so I furiously slammed together two hours worth of slides. And fortunately, I don't actually have to talk to you for two whole hours. I can make it all fit into one or even a little less than that. Um, so I will, in fact, jump around with my slide deck. So just by way of introduction, my name's Jacob Farmer. I've, I've been um, with a company called Cambridge Computer. It's really my only professional job ever. Um, I, uh, back in the early 90s, nobody would hire me, so I went into business for myself. Um, I had a business mentor who said, hey, Jacob, if you're going to start a business, name it after Cambridge, because everyone will think they've heard of you, and they won't check your references. And that turned out to be really good advice. Um, and then the other advice he said was, you know, pick a niche, something that nobody likes to do and that no one wants to be involved in and then get really good at it. And it, at the time, uh, we were in IT and we figured, well, hey, how about backup systems and archives? And I bet that problem will, will, will be a good, good niche for a couple of years. And then 20 years later, <laughs> here I am, we're doing the same old stuff. I got involved in Usenix, I think, 13 years ago, 12, 13 years ago. And uh, ever since my first Lisa, I've been coming ever since. Um, what I love about this community is I, I, I actually learn a lot from you guys, and then I'm able to kind of to give back. So I become, really, I'm like a clearinghouse for secondhand information. People share their experiences with me. I, in turn, share them with others. Um, I, I've really lost a lot of my own firsthand technology chops because I'm really now, well, I've become a consultant. In any case, what's cool about my job is that I, I am free to go mingle around the industry. I ask people lots of questions, and I digest their answers. I organize them into a framework. And then I present them back to people like you. And hopefully, you'll find some of my ideas interesting. So the first thing I want to point out is that I find that there are a couple of very simple strategies for growing big in capacity. Um, the one that I most run into is sprawl. That's just where people buy a whole lot of individual storage devices. <coughs> Sometimes they're just accumulated across uh, an organization. Somebody goes by, buys a Buffalo box, or they store some data on some spare hard drives, and they pile up to the ceiling. Um, then there's this concept of a monolith, which is like a giant storage device that you buy. And my definition of a monolith is just this one giant thing that can meet all of your foreseeable needs. And you buy it because your objective is to consolidate and have only one big thing. Um, because monoliths are big things and there's a tendency for them to get forklifted every couple of years um, and have a huge, uh, huge migration event, uh, there's another concept of what I like to call an aggregate, which is like a virtual monolith. You build it up with building blocks, and you can replace any one of those blocks and grow it as big as you like. And then um, last but not least is this notion of federating your storage, which is to take all of your, a bunch of different smaller storage devices uh, and make them behave um, as one. And I kind of personally, I believe that um, it's all a matter of what stage of pain you're in as to which direction you look toward. So if you're a small organization, and you've, you've really just got a handful of storage devices and you're, you're not in the petabyte scale, you might be perfectly happy to have a bunch of little things. Then you consolidate and you end up with something big and then eventually you, you bust out of that thing and you need to figure out how you're gonna manage your data again. So um, I was asked to give a talk at a, a life sciences conference a couple, couple months ago and I came up with this little slide which I called my five stages of data proliferation grief. And I was trying to kind of make a little pun on the Kubler-Ross model for coping with grief, you know, that's kind of like where first you, you know, you, you get angry and then you accept it and then you die and something. I don't actually, I never actually read the book. I just, you know, Wikipedia did enough to sound like I knew what I was talking about. But in any case, um, stage one is consolidation. That's where, you know, you recognize that your storage is all over the place and maybe your institution just realizes that it's not being a good steward of the data that it holds and it better get it into one place. So um, you'll notice some of these things say things like sequencers and microscopes and whatnot. Again, I, I ripped this off from my life sciences presentation. So then um, you consolidate everything into one NAS, and then you just discover that, you know, hey, this thing isn't really big enough. It can't do big enough file systems. Um, everybody's busting out of it. So you buy your scale-out NAS. And scale-out is a term that the vendors seem to like um, to describe um, growing bigger and bigger and bigger uh, limitlessly. Um, and they, they lead you to believe that you can, in fact, build, um, build out limitlessly. Um, then what happens is kind of the backup futility. Like you realize, oh my goodness, there's just no way to back up 
all this data in any meaningful amount of time. And then from that, you deduce that if you ever had to restore it, you wouldn't be able to restore it in any meaningful amount of time. Um, the next stage in all of that is sort of the budget anxiety. You realize that you bought this really big, expensive thing, and um, uh, it's going to get refreshed in a couple years. And now I'm maybe looking at doubling it because um, I, I've got, I can't back it up, so I've got to replicate it. Um, and then the, the last stage is kind of when you've just got so much storage, you can't find anything anymore. You realize that you know, if you have, a, if you have a, a, a petabyte of data and, you know, I don't know, an average file size of a couple of megabytes or even if a file size of a gigabyte, it's not unlikely that you have a few hundred million files or maybe a billion files. And if you think about what it, what it looks like, what a directory path could look like, when you have that, you know, just a namespace. It's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of files. And by the way, if you have a billion files today, presumably you will have two billion files sometime in the future, and then four and eight and 16 and 32 and all that other stuff. So the, the problem I think that we're all living in is as our different disciplines become more data intensive and as new file formats consume more storage, we're actually a snowball rolling down the hill. Like the rate of accumulation does seem to pick up. And um, if you just imagine out a few years, you know, we're, we're all going to have a lot more data than we have now. <coughs> Quick show of hands. How many of you guys already have your first petabyte? Anybody out there? Excellent. And of those who didn't raise your hands, do you think you'll have a petabyte in the next five years? How many of you? So, yeah. So, I mean, I think a petabyte just, like I used to go, oh, my goodness, you have a petabyte? So cool. And now it's like, yeah, whatever. You got a petabyte. Congratulations. Um, so you're going to have lots of petabytes. And I, I think the problem, though, is that it's, we're just reaching a disproportionately large scale where it's problematic. So some of the problems of having a petabyte, I hinted at a couple of these, but one is just the, the size of an individual file system. I visited a client um, two years ago that's a big digital content repository. And um, when they first started out their, their, their uh, software application, uh, they were targeting having like 20, 30, maybe 40 terabytes of digital images. And they had um, selected a NAS that had a maximum file system of 10 terabytes. And then when they reached the two petabyte mark, you know, there were 200 of those file systems that made up uh, their storage system. And then they replicated each one of those. And then they were looking at three-way replication of each of those. And because they had so many of these file systems and they kind of came on sequentially, they were always refreshing one of them. But basically every week there was a file system to migrate into a new file system. And then, of course, as they added the second and third data centers, that became an incredibly complex task to manage. And as you also might have imagine, um, every once in a while they would make a boo-boo because they're doing so much stuff, and they actually managed to lose some data in the course of it that turned out not to be replaceable. And that created a whole big firestorm of pain. So basically, file systems need to get bigger. Um, backup and restore, I just mentioned what a problem that is. Um, fault tolerance, you know that, that old adage, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Well, it just turns out that if you have a couple thousand hard drives, the probability of having one or two or three break is much greater than when you only have 10 hard drives. And if you have really big hard drives, well, there's issues like the, you know, they're, they're no more reliable. A three terabyte hard drive is not any more reliable than a one terabyte drive. So the relative probability of losing data seems to go up as the drives get bigger. You get higher bit error rates. There's more data in one place to be broken when it breaks. So in general, things become, the, the engineering term is brittle. As they get bigger and bigger, they become more and more brittle. One little flick, and potentially the whole thing can come down. Um, or if you do have a disaster or a minor disaster, like a data corruption in the wrong place, in a petabyte, that data corruption could spread far and wide. And, and discovering the corruption and remedying it might be a huge task. Um, disaster recovery, this is a funny problem. You know, we're all, we're, most of us are used to replicating a SAN or a NAS or a storage device to our DR location. And normally, we don't have disasters, so we don't really worry about it. But if we did, we would presumably replicate back. Or we would maybe do some other way of, you know, we'd maybe ship a box out there, replicate, and move it back. But let's just say I've replicated my petabyte from New York to Los Angeles. And I come in the work tomorrow morning, and there's this smoldering pile of metal where once my petabyte sat. You know, what do I do? Like, do I drive to LA and throw this thing in the back of my minivan and drive back across the country? You know, no, that's not going to be practical. I'm probably, if I could buy a brand new petabyte and have it rush shipped to me, how am I going to replicate that petabyte over, the, over my WAN link anytime soon? Um, I'm probably going to have to ship a new petabyte out to Los Angeles mirror it there, which is going to take a couple of weeks, 
box it up and ship it, and then resync it. We're still talking about an enormous amount of work. So again, you ask yourself, how do I have high availability or uptime or DR at petabyte scale? It's really quite tricky. Um, hardware refreshes, um, you know, really funny situation, ha ha. I had a client who bought a petabyte for their research institution, and by the time they kind of got it bought and plugged in and running and announced to everybody that the petabyte was there, they were already halfway into the life cycle of the product and there was no capacity on it. And then a couple months, you know, by the time they reached the three-year mark, there was about 200 terabytes of it, and now they're getting ready to refresh the box. Now, as good luck had it, they didn't really have the money to refresh it, so they kind of returned everybody's data to them, and that was that. That was the good luck. Um, and then, of course, these namespace issues. And depending on how much time I consume um, babbling at you, I'll give you some other examples of what I see as the namespace issues um, a little bit later on. So I always like to ask this question, you know, bigger hard drives, friend or foe? You know, hard drives keep getting bigger. We now have three terabyte drives. I'm sure we'll have fours or eights or twelves or twenties someday. And as the drives get bigger and bigger, they don't become more reliable. Um, they actually seem to become less reliable. And it just seems to me, I haven't done any math on it, but it just seems in general that two terabyte and three terabyte storage systems aren't working as well as they did when we had one terabytes and smaller. Um, we, we also know that RAID rebuilds are a problem as the drives get bigger and bigger. Like I found in my own practice, you know, a good rule of thumb is a, a day and a half to rebuild a terabyte of RAID 5. Um, so that just means that a three terabyte drive should take four and a half days and it's probably only going to get worse from there. Um, this is a little picture of just like a common enterprise RAID array um, for, for massive scale where you might have 60, 48, 84, some enormous number of hard drives in a 4U cabinet, and you might have multiple 4U cabinets uh, in a rack, and then you stripe your data across the cabinet. Um, this is how most organizations that have petabyte-sized data, this is typically how they build a giant, huge storage system for it. So, and, and, and I can't say anything bad about these things. I've got lots of clients using them. The problem is, is that any one of these shelves is a pretty big frew to lose. You know, the idea of, I, I, I like to raid stripe across the shelf, that way if I lose a shelf, I haven't lost my data, but I got a really big rebuild ahead of me if I do. So if you take 84 drives and you multiply that by three terabytes, and I can't really do that math, and at least I try not to do math in public if I can help it, but I think that's around 250 terabytes. And that's a quarter of a petabyte in a, in a, in a single thing that could break. Um, and you try to imagine how long it would take to restripe that into a raid array, you know, we're really talking about, about weeks, if not months. Um, this is a slide I made. It was inspired by one of, uh, one of my clients who um, had, he had a, a storage system he was really worried about because it had roughly two and a half billion small files in it. And he knew he couldn't back up and restore that in any meaningful amount of time. And it had to, he needed a high level of uptime for his business because, he, well, you know, it was his business. So his, his idea was that he would buy a bunch of inexpensive storage devices buy some like SAN appliances to mirror them up together, and then he would kind of dial up this super high level of redundancy. Um, and that way, when something breaks, you know, no big deal, he's covered. So um, the, uh, the idea here is that these are like, you know, 48 terabyte RAID boxes. These devices mirror those RAID boxes together. Let me get rid of my little elephant, my Evernote resync message. So his idea was that this would be like a super duper resilient storage system. No single points of failure. Anything could, could survive an outage. Um, what do you guys think? Does anyone think good idea, bad idea? Anybody want to buy one of these? So I was against this when he bought it. I was like, you know what? This, this just feels over-engineered to me. Like I think, you know, something's going to like burp and then restripe forever. And the reason I was against it is I had a client just a few months earlier than this who was a, a hospital, a radiology department in a hospital, and they had a roughly 20 terabyte primary storage for medical images for, you know, actual clinical data. And they had some free money in the budget, so they bought another 20 terabyte disk array to mirror it. And their thinking was, hey, two RAID 5 arrays, or maybe they were RAID 6, I don't remember. You know, that's got to be more reliable than one. And what happened to them was that a couple months into the game, one of those controllers just hiccuped. It, like, you know, it's, it froze, and they had to reboot the RAID. And the volume manager did what any good volume manager would do. It, it re-mirrored the drives. Right? So three plus weeks later, it was done re-mirroring this RAID array. And a couple of weeks after that, 
The other RAID controller had a similar kind of hiccup, um, and it too needed to be remirrored, and it remirrored the other direction for three weeks and change. And you think to yourself, well, what would have happened if these two hiccup events had overlapped with each other, right? What happens when you have two mirror drives and they both go down before the mirroring finishes? And you lose your data. So in a funny way, two mirror drives was re less reliable than one. And that just raises this question of, well, and, and I already said here before about how 250 terabyte bricks, you know, are a little bit scary. So you start asking yourself, well, how do you big, build big and how do you build resilient? You know, how do you build redundancy across cabinets where you can tolerate outages? Um, and I see that as a big problem. Um, basically, storage systems become big and brittle as they get bigger and bigger. So the way I like to describe this phenomenon is just this notion that we're always looking for the bigger brick, um, the, the, the bigger MTU, as it might be. So if I want to build an outhouse, you know, what am I going to build it out of? Well, if, if you know me personally, you know I'm going to build it out of bricks. Um, similarly, if I were a little piggy and I were building a house, I would build it out of bricks. Um, if I'm building um, an actual house and I want to put a foundation in, bricks are kind of a nuisance. There's, you know, kind of small, there's a lot of mortar work to do. Much more efficient to use a cinder block. I can still pick it up and carry it, um, but I, I, I do fewer IOPS to build a foundation with a cinder block. And if I'm going to build a pyramid, well, of course, I'm going to build it out of boulders because that's the way you build a pyramid. But then what if I want to build a parking garage? You know, I'm not but following this logic to build a parking garage, I would need to carve it out of the side of a mountain. And I'd have to have a mountain where I want to put the parking garage. It's, it's just not convenient. So many, many years of engineering, we came up with this idea of concrete, where we take little tiny grains of sand, and we come up with a way to aggregate these little grains together. And as we aggregate the grains together, we can make anything we want. We can make it suitably resilient. We can scale. We can shape. We can do all of that. And I, I think that when we translate this into, um, into IT terms, um, little grains of sand are like little objects. And there's a whole trend in the industry right now to build storage systems out of object models. Um, the biggest of these trends is the, is the cloud. You know, if you use a service like Amazon S3 or Google, they're taking little data objects, throwing them up into a cloud, and if you ask for them back again later, they give them to you. Um, and, a, and a lot of people are taking this paradigm um, and building very interesting, large, scalable storage systems out of them. Um, and I'll share some thoughts about that a little bit later as I meander through my deck. So a couple other issues about backing up a petabyte. Um, this is just a fun little slide I put together. I was just trying to think, hey, how long does it take to actually copy a petabyte using different types of wires or, or transfers? And um, I, at 140 megabytes a second, which is an LTO5 drive at full tilt, not assuming any compression or anything, it would take 82 and a half days. And if I had a 10 gigabit Ethernet, it's at 11 days. Um, my favorite, of course, is the T1 at 176 years. Um, and then even if you should happen to sp have a pretty beefy circuit at your disposal, you know, get yourself an OC48, you're still looking at 40 days. So, so again, this idea of like copying the petabyte over the WAN, um, that's, that's a little daunting. Um, and even copying the petabyte to tape. I mean, if I had 10 tape drives, theoretically, that's, um, you know, that's eight days each, roughly. Uh, I could do, sorry, I could do the whole thing in eight days. And if I had 20 tape drives, maybe four days. Um, but the problem is, is that, is that um, when we actually look at how you back things up for real, if I go buy myself a petabyte size NAS, um, most NAS systems rely on NDMP as a protocol for backing up the NAS. And the NDMP is a protocol that, that um, allows backup software to tell the NAS to back itself up, make sure it catches all the relevant metadata for the NAS, um, and doesn't require any special software running on the NAS. Well, so that's the best practice for NAS. But what's the best practice everywhere else? Well, in most traditional backup systems, we know we can't do fulls and incrementals every single week. You know, a full backup once a week of data that hasn't changed doesn't make any sense. So most smart backup software either does an incremental forever where it only takes incremental backups. It might do a synthetic full backup where it takes last week's full backup and this week's incrementals and mushes them all together to synthesize next week's full. Or it might even go down underneath a file and capture granular changes, you know, either block level changes or transaction level changes, whatever it may be. So the way that a normal, a normal scalable backup system works is doesn't work with NDMP. 
And then to complicate things, it turns out that NDMP is, um, is single-threaded. So if I really did want to light up 20 tape drives to move that petabyte of data in less than a week, I would have to manually come up with a way of breaking up the backup jobs into 20 individual jobs, setting them all loose, um, and somehow or other tracking that, because the backup software, it turns out, isn't that good at that stuff. Um, so, so backing up a petabyte is actually really, really hard, and the industry isn't providing us with the proper tools to do it. Um, replication in DR, I kind of already said this, the, the idea of if my backup system can't cut it, I probably have to replicate the data to another live petabyte. Um, that's going to be tricky. I've got to get it over there. I might have to replicate it back. Um, and even if I do that, is the replication good enough? You know, do I still need a backup? Does anybody here just use replication and no backup for their data? Any folks doing that? No, not a lot of people. Um, and why is that? Well, you could have a corruption. And I, I'll tell you another weird thing. You know, don't quote me on this. I don't have any numbers to back it up. I just feel that the rate of data corruptions and other like weird things that go bump in the night just seems a lot greater in the last year or two. Now, again, I'm referring to data storage. That's the industry I work in. But it just feels to me that either people are pushing the envelope or the vendors are rushing products to market. Or it could just be that every time you know, a new hard drive comes to market, um, the vendors have to qualify the daylights out of it because there's always nuances in the way that error handling is done in a brand new hard drive. And there always seems to be something that sneaks through, um, causes a corruption or some other weird error. So in short, we're just a little bit worried about about um, the, uh, uh, the, the realistically replicating without having some kind of backup. Um, so when we think about tiers is another area that, that um, <coughs> comes a lot, up a lot in my conversations. And a lot of my clients have just kind of said, hey, you know what? Tiering is actually more trouble than it's worth. It's so much easier to have all the files in one big namespace. It's really hard to have to kind of figure out what goes on what tier. Most tiering solutions are kind of cumbersome, and they're all really expensive. It seems like it's just sort of cheaper and easier just to, uh, to, to get one tier. Um, and I think that's probably true um, to a large degree. The problem is that pressure on tiering is being stretched in two directions. When I say pressure, that when I say, nah, I don't want to bother tiering, well, but then there are all these really cool solid state storage devices that keep hitting the market with just insane performance numbers and cheaper and cheaper costs every other day. And then at the far end of the spectrum, uh, tape seems to be having a rebirth as an archival media. That is, the, the vendors in the tape industry kind of figured out that their, their marketplace is eroding really quickly, and they better come up with either software or solutions um, that are relevant and priced appropriately. So we've seen in the last few years kind of a big scramble to, to actually make tape great um, as a, uh, a low-cost, low-power you know, cheap and deep place for data to reside long term. So I made this little slide up and for my solid state storage lecture that I gave yesterday. And I thought I would cut and paste it in for today. We were trying to illustrate just how fast um, solid state can be relative to, um, to spinning disk. Um, and we did it using um, a nanosecond of latency is roughly a pound of weight. Now if you go and double check my math, you will find that we took a little poetic license here but it still does the trick. So we're basically saying, hey, if CPU is like a can of Coke, a level two cache is like a bowling ball, uh, RAM is like a dog, a nice big burly dog, and spinning disk is like an Eiffel Tower. And as you know, these aren't drawn to proportion, right? That would be one hell of a big dog, you know, <laughs> roughly a third of the way up the tower. You know, the dog would really be, you know, down here somewhere. So that space between the dog and the tip of the Eiffel Tower, uh, that's the solid state storage marketplace. Like you can have a RAM based solid state storage device that could de deliver over you know, a million and a half IOs per second, you know, or you could have a spinning hard drive that does 200 IOs per second. Big difference between 200 and a million and a half. I think that's 750, you know, 75,000. I don't know. Don't do math out loud, as my grandma used to say. Um, and then on the tape end, this is a slide I, I grabbed from a, pres from a, a system I did for uh, Yale University last year. Um, we put in this just ginormous campus tape archive where we put a tape library in, in each of two campuses, lit it up, um, and replicated between the two. And we were able to hit a, a cost per, per terabyte, you know, somewhere on the order of 100 bucks per terabyte per year. 
maybe a little bit more than that, for a redundant terabyte that was you know, off-site and on different pieces of media, et cetera. And that's just a really good number compared to an enterprise scale out NAS. So I got these, you know, the point is I think no matter whenever I pick whatever it is that I can live with forever, it turns out tomorrow something new comes out and I want that too. So I want something faster, I want something cheaper. The, the, the more I want one of those two things, the less likely I am to be happy inside that one single uh, solution. Um, I, I love these two terms. We've been using them a lot, worse and worn. We find that a lot of data at petabyte scale, just the nature of the beast, it's hard to use your whole petabyte at the same time. So worse and worn, worse is write once, read seldom if ever, and worn is write once, read never. A lot of data sets seem to fit that, that, um, that pa pattern, especially if you're talking about research data. A lot of times you save your raw data uh, just in case you need it again later. Maybe you save some intermediary results that aren't that relevant. Maybe you're planning to publish your research um, sometime in the next few years and you've got to keep everything related to it. Um, and maybe you're not sure what you're going to need for your research, so you better keep everything. So, but when you have data that just sits there, we call that fixed content. It's just sitting there on your disk. And there does come a point, I think in particular, when you reach the petabyte scale, where the amount of money and time and resources that go into having that stuff sit there um, starts being somewhat significant. Um, anyway, so that's, um, that's fixed content. Um, you know, the next best strategy um, uh, in, in a lifecycle management system is to have a, a single NAS that has multiple tiers in it. And if you walk the vendor expo today, there were several vendors marketing that. But again, we still come up with this problem of is their top tier fast enough and is their bottom tier cheap enough um, to be compelling? And, and I find in general the answer is no. Um, the other question, of course, is, is, is a tier just about performance? You know, it could be a tier is about data integrity assurance or a tier could be about security or, or geographic proximity. So lots of things could make up a tier. Um, anyway, those are some ideas on tiering. Let me fast forward a bit. Um, and let me introduce just the idea of federating storage, which to me is where we'd really like to be. The problem is, is that the marketplace for federated storage solutions doesn't really quite exist or it exists in kind of crude forms. So the idea of a federated file system is I, I take a bunch of ordinary everyday fi file servers and I magically make them behave as one logical file server, ideally with a single namespace that makes it easy for my users to find things. And then if that were the case, these things could be, you know, I could have an expensive one and a cheap one and a fast one and a slow one and I could have whatever I want, presumably, and some magical logic that would place my files on the appropriate file server and everything would be great. Um, I like to point out that anytime we virtualize anything or abstract anything, we have the choice of putting the abstraction logic in the data path or outside of the data path. And whenever we do in-band anything with large file systems, we run the risk of slowing things down, basically adding latency. Um, and um, <clears throat> we also, of course, have the problem that if the in-band thing breaks, that probably means we don't have access to the data anymore. Um, and then if we can do it out of band, we have the problem of what happens if the user goes directly to the storage and starts messing with things. Um, then um, potentially they would, they would break whatever virtual namespace we were trying to build. So that's just a problem that has to be solved for now, take it for granted, in band or out of band. Um, an example of an out of band would be like I have some namespace um, that I'm, I'm accessing from the side and then I'm reading and writing directly to my, to my servers. Um, an in band is I would be talking to the magical layer and the magical layer would, would be reconciling down with the underlying file servers. Um, Another interesting point I'd like to make when I talk about tiers is that tiers and caching are kind of the same idea. They're just sort of at a different scale in time. So you could kind of think of like tiering as caching in slow motion, where the data actually is going to sit and reside for a little while um, before we reprioritize. You could also think of it as a cache. Um, uh, you could also think of caching as tiering on steroids, you know, where I, I, the, the change rate at which tier something belongs on is, is, is moving very, very, very quickly. And to that end, I've, I've, I've noted that a couple of vendors that are in the caching space have started adding a global namespace capability to their, to their devices, and a couple of vendors in the global namespace have been trying to add um, uh, caching capabilities. But the idea in theory would be that I put all my high-speed stuff in some layer, and then I could buy all cheap and deep storage down below, and the magical layers would take care of it for me. Um, 
So these are just some kind of clever ideas folks have for solving the problem. But then in theory, once I've done that, I can migrate my files around. Um, maybe I have all kinds of tiers, like in this little artist representation, I federated everything I got. I got a file server, an enterprise NAS, some high capacity NAS, a tape archival file system, uh, and even a cloud store. So you can kind of imagine having all different kinds of storage systems and some policy-based engine that decides what to place where. Now, I'm still kind of talking fantasies right now. I'm saying this is what I would love to have. There is no single vendor that just makes all this in a way that just works. Um, but, you know, we keep holding our breath and we keep looking for what the reasonable set of compromises are um, to get close to this, to this vision. So um, on the subject of cloud gateways, I thought I'd just share a couple observations I've made um, about clouds and how they might become relevant to people who don't otherwise use clouds. Um, so clouds are really based on this notion of object-based storage, where you, you're, an object is just a discrete piece of data that can be individually addressed and manipulated. Um, and there's lots of different ways in which you know, the concept of objects are used in all aspects of IT. But in data storage, we just mean a chunk of data. And the key differentiator is that storage has always used addressing schemes of files and blocks. You know, a block is just a unit of raw data, and a file is an object consisting of multiple blocks. And in this case, an object is neither a file nor a block. It could be a file, it could be a block, it could be a piece of a file, it could be a grouping of blocks. It doesn't really matter, it's whatever the system decides it is. It's just like a chunk of data that has an address associated with it. So um, whenever I talk about storage, I talk about storage having a layered architecture that begins with an application and ends with a storage device. And the layers are typically an application makes function calls to, a file, to an operating system, which makes function calls to a file system, which updates blocks on disk. I might stick a logical volume manager in there. I might stick a disk controller in there. I might put some device into a SAN fabric. There's lots of different ways that I could abstract that storage I.O. path. And what I think is kind of neat about object storage systems is that they live at all levels of the storage I.O. path. You could have an application that reads and writes directly into an object store. It doesn't even have a file system because it doesn't really care about POSIX or permissions or, or file hierarchies. It just needs an address. The piece of data I want has this address. It's some 64-bit number. I give it to the object store. The object store gives me my data. I do my thing. There are, there are file system examples of this where maybe I have a gateway that, that connects to Amazon or some other cloud service and makes it look like a file server. Um, maybe I have some other type of file system that uses an object model underneath the hood. So objects are kind of interesting, and the folks who do, um, who build big kind of cloudy object stores, what they're, what they're arguing is that they have a better, simple, more convincing fault tolerance model than we get with traditional RAID systems. Um, and I thought I'd just walk you through kind of what the concepts are, because they're, they're worthy of thought. So the idea is if I zoom in on one of the hard drives in my object store, so these are just I don't know, super micro chassis or something off the shelf. They could be, they're just boxes with disks in them. I zoom in on one of those disks and there are a bunch of objects. So I've got a little diamond and I got a, a star and I have a, a pentagon and a heart. Those are my objects. And you'll notice that each one of those objects is stored redundantly. It's on the hard drive in question, but it also has a redundant pair on a different hard drive somewhere else. And as you might imagine, if something bad were to happen to that hard drive, word goes out to the other little objects that you're no longer conforming to the redundancy model, you have to propagate yourself to another object, to another drive somewhere, and they go ahead and do that, and now I'm back to resiliency. So this isn't rocket science, I'm sure plenty of you are bored, but the observation is really simple, that I'm applying data protection logic to the data, I mean, I'm applying it to an object, rather than to a storage device. So this kind of gets me around that problem of how the storage devices keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and the RAID arrays keep getting more and more brittle. They have more failures, and it takes them longer to recover from the failures. And while they're recovering, they're vulnerable to even more failures. Um, this is very different. This basically says, hey, you know what? I got a petabyte full of storage. I got, uh, I got a 200 hard drives, more than that, I guess, 300 hard drives, 350. And if one of them breaks, I can parallelize the process of rebuilding the data. They can basically all spin up and make copies of whatever data they have and compensate for the data loss. So what I really like about the cloudy object model 
is that it really lends itself to this wide area replication problem that our conventional NASs don't play nicely with. You know, I gave you that example before, my petabyte NAS blew up. How do I get it back over here in any meaningful amount of time? Well, in the object model, I put my object in in the main location. It gets replicated to a, device, a disk somewhere in the other location. And if something bad were to happen um, to either all or part of the main location, I can still just reference the data um, over the other side of the WAN. And when it comes to, to, to re, re, reverting back to a, a working state, I only need to bring over the objects that were affected. I don't need to necessarily bring the whole thing over. You know, I like to give the example, if I walk up to your RAID array in your data center, and I just casually pop a couple hard drives out of the shelf and pop them right back in, you know, like, whoosh, whoosh, less than a second, right? What happens? You start rebuilding, or the arrays come down. And if they come down, they don't just come back, typically. Like most, most disk arrays get really unhappy when you yank out their hard drives. Um, so, so uh, but in an object store, you have much more tolerance for that. A hard drive comes out, put it back in. So I believe that one of the neat things about this is that we can build really, really big scale super duper engineering. Like we don't necessarily have to have the latest and greatest RAID storage logic or super duper expensive um, componentry. We might actually just be able to slap together some relatively inexpensive gear, dial up a really high level of redundancy, um, and off we go. Um, and then another concept, kind of a competing paradigm in the object world, is to use Reed Solomon style encoding to create redundancy on data objects. And sometimes this is called erasure coding. So basically, there's my new object up there on the left. I, I, I put it into my, my uh, data protection algorithm. It chops it up into n number of segments. In this case, I picked nine. It adds an x number of parity segments. In this case, I picked three. And then basically, as long as nine of these 12 data segments survive, um, I get my data back, right? So that means that if I go you know, up to this shelf of disks, I take out my gun, bang, 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 I shoot out three drives, any three drives, look, I still have my object. If I walk up to this shelf and I just go, eh, and I pull the power plug and it comes down, um, I still get my object. So when you apply this to a really, really large amount of drives and a really, really large amount of data, and if you dial up, you know, I picked, I picked 9.3, but if you dial that number up, use a lot more elements and for, for data and a lot more elements for parity, the actual probability of you losing data just goes, you know, very, 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 very low. Um, and uh, I, I have a client who's a very early adopter of a commercial version of this technology. And he had, um, he's got, I think he's going up for 40 petabytes of it. But he was joking the other day. He said, I had three drives just crash on a Friday afternoon. And I was like, oh, this is annoying. I guess I'll deal with this on Monday when I get back. Because by his math, he would, he would have to lose a specific six drives for his data to be, a, to, to be compromised. And out of the couple thousand drives he has, pro the probability of that's pretty much non-existent. So, the only, uh, but incidentally, there's, a, there's another group of folks that are trying to use this technology to disperse data across a WAN, where the idea would be that as long as, you know, three of my four data centers are still standing, I've got a complete collection of data, you know, using a minimal amount of hardware. So the only bummer is, is that these object cloudy things, you know, they're, they're not the way users use storage. You know, users read and write to hierarchical file systems, you know, with, with uh, POSIX and permissions and all that other stuff. So there is kind of a cottage industry or a bunch of different applications that bridge the, the gap between the two, usually with some kind of gateway device of some sort. Um, and what we're kind of waiting for is for these gateway devices to get smarter and smarter and smarter um, and to make it easier to, um, to, to both live in the world of files and objects at the same time. So I'm kind of down to my 10 minute warning. So I thought what I would do is make, oh, never mind, I'm right here. Wow, I'm right on time. I just made this presentation as I was walking in the door, and my timing is perfect. I wanted to talk about namespace issues. When you have, you know, a, a couple billion files, you know, how do you find them? Um, so I see this kind of stuff a lot when we look at big file systems. Um, I have a client here locally in Massachusetts that we're, we're doing, um, so a little side note is that I, I've been spending a lot of my own personal time and 
an awful lot of my company's financial resources um, tinkering out around with software ideas for really reining in petabytes of storage. So we, we built a prototype of an application, and if you're really curious, um, we're going to do a boff this evening around 8 o'clock and just sort of talk through some of these ideas in more detail and maybe show you some screens from our software. Um, but we basically built um, a tool that would help our clients kind of analyze their existing file systems and profile their users and get an idea of how different people are storing data and what they're doing. And we ran this, um, this uh, software for this client, and we saw a lot of stuff like this. You know, we saw people looking for a way to put descriptive information into the directory tree, or not. So you'd see a directory named stuff. <laughs> like, what the heck does that mean? You know, or the stuff do not delete. But then we'd also see things like whole sentences, you know, worked into a, a UNC path. You know, raw results from experiment number three, run 23, March 10th. We'd see stuff like that. Um, the funniest thing we saw, incidentally, was um, we found that 6% of the files in our test set had the, the word junk in the file name. Um, and we didn't look for things like crap or turd or anything else <laughs> like that. We just looked for junk, and we found 6%. So um, uh, we also found a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of iPod collections, you know, or iTunes. Um, so people put all kinds of stuff, and it's, it's basically buried in the mountain of data. Um, uh, uh, no one ever sees it. So we thought we could kind of root that stuff out by, by inventorying all the files, looking for patterns, asking questions of the users, and other things like that. Um, I talked a little bit about the, just the, the mechanical problem of backing up and restoring a petabyte. But it's, it's really more than that. You know, a lot of my clients, especially the science ones, say we don't need to re back up and restore the petabyte. We just regenerate the data if we ever had to. And that's true in many cases. But when you're talking a petabyte or two petabytes or three petabytes, it would still be a drag to lose all that data. Like, it's still a lot of data to lose. But what about the really important stuff? You know, in, in many cases, it isn't practical to, to, to recover um, everything. So it, backup speak, the industry uses these terms RPO and RTO. And RPO is a recovery point objective. It's a fancy way of saying how much data are you willing to lose if something breaks. And an RTO is a recovery time objection, objective. It's a fancy way of saying how long are you willing to wait until you get your data back. And, um, and that's the basis of backup policies. Um, then there's, of course, retention periods. How long do you keep something or how many versions and all of that. Well, how do you build a policy across a whole petabyte? Is there one policy that meets all of your data's needs? You know, we heard from a bunch of people at the conference this week that, well, no, you know, some of our data is pretty precious, but then there's a lot of scratch files and intermediary files and other stuff like that. But conveying all that to your backup software would be really, really, really hard. So here again, like we just, we'd like to know more. We need more descriptive information about the files to build good storage management policies. Um, file migration, you know, people migrate files for different reasons. One is just as they age, they have different value or different meaning, so you move them around. Um, sometimes it's for backup and recovery. Sometimes you're trying to put things in and out of a cloud. Sometimes, you know, you're migrating because you're refreshing a storage device. But it would really help when you're trying to migrate files is to understand what you're migrating and why you're migrating them. Um, another huge problem that we run into is that when we do try to migrate files for whatever reason, um, we tend to break applications. So many applications reference files by UNC path. You might have a DAM system, digital asset management, a laboratory information management system. You may have a PAC system, that's a medical imaging system. Um, you might have electronic notebooks. You might just have spreadsheets that reference files. So what happens when you pick all those things up and you move the files? You break those links and you may not be able to reconcile them again later. Um, so these are kind of problems that we worry about and we're trying to invent solutions for. Um, just basic inventory and reporting, you know, capacity planning, who's using what, what's the change rate, what's the growth rate. Um, trend analysis, that's nice to know. Um, duplicate file detection. So I mentioned this client we did this study for. We found roughly 7% of the file set was duplicately stored. Now, we didn't go study exactly what level of duplication. We just know that 7% of the files had an identical matching one somewhere on the file system. That's still a lot of waste. Um, and then kind of last but not least is chargeback. We find that a lot of organizations, when the storage starts costing enough money, they look to find out who else could pay for it. And either you have internal chargeback, like 
your institution wants to charge individual departments or you want to charge different projects. Um, we've also seen that in, in research computing, there's a desire to charge back to the actual grants. And if you want to do that, you've got to be real specific and real careful about it, and you have to have proper audit trails and everything else. So one of the things that we actually built into our little software application was we built the ability to put a, a capacity number against every folder in a directory tree so the user can actually see how big each folder is. We multiply that times a dollar amount for the tier, um, and that tells them how much money it costs to store files in that folder. And then ideally, that becomes the basis of a carrot and stick mechanism that encourages them to curate their data a little bit, like tell us a little something about what you're storing and why. Um, so uh, then, of course, when you have a petabyte of data, you could just say, yeah, you know what, I'm just going to keep on adding more and more storage. I'm not going to worry about cleaning it up. But really, there is a point where you probably have to throw some data away. If nothing else, all the junky old data um, confuses the value of the data that you really care about. But of course, you don't want to delete data unless you have a better understanding of what it is. So I think really the theme here is that the more data you have, the less you can rely on tribal knowledge or individual person's memory to know what something is. You have to start building up an intelligence or some metadata around what those files are. And I think the good news of all of that is that the idea of tagging files or throwing key values against your data, um, those things are being brought to us by cloud applications. Like you might have noticed that little annoying thing in the bottom corner of my screen. That was my Evernote trying to sync. And right before that, my Dropbox kicked off a little note that it was trying to sync. And I think as users get accustomed to tagging their images in Facebook or adding metadata through Evernote or through whatever cloudy applications they use, I think we can make file storage cloudy. Like it can be the kinds of things we're used to with, with cloud storage and cloud applications um, rather than giant monolithic NASes with billions and billions of files stored in a file hierarchy. So, uh, <clears throat> this other concept I like is the data next of kin. Um, that's the idea that someone leaves the organization, and if they didn't describe it well enough, they leave behind a mess that no one can make sense out of. Um, so the idea of basically knowing, and not just knowing through file permissions, but much more deliberately, you know, who owns this data, who uses this data, and who cares about it afterwards. Um, so a really great question, I think, is where does all this metadata go? If I gather up all this metadata, it's got to go in a system somewhere. And there are a number of folks trying to build metadata file systems. Um, I think I've got a slide or two on this. Yeah, there's a group um, called IRODS at a University of North Carolina who have actually been doing some collaboration with. IRODS is actually part UNC and part UC San Diego. Um, and their previous work was a thing called Storage Resource Broker, or SRB. And these were, were uh, frameworks for associating metadata with file systems and then applying rules and data management policies to that metadata. Um, and my criticism of, the, of these approaches was that these always wanted to live in the data path. That is, if you wanted to get your data, you would go to their system, you would look up what you're looking for, and it would deliver it to you. Um, and one of the real problems with that was that it didn't really actually respect um, file system permissions on the live file systems. It basically, they became the broker. So we've been playing with these same ideas, but with the idea um, that our system could live entirely out of band, out of the data path where it doesn't break anything. So basically, in other words, we're trying to build up this sort of magical catalog that allows your files to behave more like objects. And if they're stored in file systems, great. If they're stored in object stores, okay. If they're stored in both, maybe the object store becomes the backup of your file system. Um, maybe it becomes a tier. Um, the real I I idea that I really like is that in, um, in digital preservation speak, you know, that is the folks at Library of Congress and the big university libraries, they all have the notion that the backup copy is actually the primary copy. And the copy that you're using on the spinning disk is like a cache of it. You know, so in other words, if you think about an enterprise storage, your primary data is the stuff on the spinning disk, and your backup is a copy of that that you might go to if you really needed it. Um, in digital preservation, it's the other way around. The gold copy is the one that's in the protected media with checksumming and hashing and all kinds of other things to ensure its integrity. And then the copy that you're actually using is really just a transient cache. And if the primary storage goes away, nah, we don't care. That was just for, you know, for play purposes. So I kind of think that the cloud model, the idea of having a big old cloud, this giant inexpensive, get as close to the cost of media as possible, you know, geographically dispersed repository of objects, that would be a really neat place to keep our most precious gold copies.
And then we would just need some way of, um, of, of tracking, cataloging, following the provenance of these objects as they move from file system to object stores and back to file systems again. So that's kind of our grandiose mwahaha vision of like, how to conquer the world. Um, the, uh, I think I probably should stop at this point because I'm out of time, right? And I could probably take a question or a comment or two, right? Sorry? Nine minutes for questions. So did I stimulate anybody's curiosity? And be sure to come use the microphone. Thanks, Doug. Somebody had to ask a question. It might as well be you. Doug Hughes, DE Shaw Research. Um, one of the things I've always sort of wrestled with with the object store model is doing backups. And, and how do you find all of these objects out there effectively and then what do you do with them? Where do you put them so that you can restore them into this object system? What do they look like when they're de-objectified and put into a <laughs> tape library well, I mean, the, the, somehow? Sure, so Doug's question, I, well, you heard it. You're on a microphone. I'll have to restate your question. because. Um, so OK, so an object is just a chunk of data. It could yeah. live anywhere. And it could live in two places or three places. I mean, it should have some address of some sort. And somebody created that object. And ideally, at the point of the object being created, we make some note of its existence and how it should be stored. So um, I'll give you an example. I have a client that is experimenting with object stores for a large web application where they plan to have two or three petabytes of data. And they need to have it distributed to three different data centers with reasonable failover between them. But they also have a mandate that everything has to be backed up onto tape. Um, and they also don't trust a single vendor to provide a storage system of that gravity. So we've actually looked at doing two different things for them. The one approach is to pass that object to a storage broker, like an IRODS, an SRB, or the type of software I'm playing with, and then to fork it. One copy goes into the object store. Another copy goes into a different object store. Maybe that second copy goes into a tape archive, and that becomes the, the, the backup. Um, and another simple way to do it is to write the data directly into the object store. And the application that writes the data then takes the ID of that object, passes that to the backup system. The backup system then takes that object ID, queries the object store, pulls it back down, throws it into the tape or into another object store or some other disk or whatever you might like. But I think so for the purposes of backup, I think fundamentally an object is just a discrete unit of data. And one of its properties should be where it lives. And if it lives in multiple places, even better, that becomes two properties. It lives here, and it lives here. Does that answer your question, yeah, sort of? that's a good answer. Thanks. Again, like, we need software to do this. And you know, that's what I've been clicking away on for the last couple of years. Yes? Hi, Sean Wilson, uh, NOAA. Couple thing, couple questions pop up. Um, one is, what's happening on the desktop um, experience side? Um, OSX, it kind of knows what your file types are, so it can do something there. And then reflecting on your object idea, how is that much different than your individual collection of um, blocks, right? Your, your file is broken up on a file system into blocks that are referenced by inodes and chunked away by the file system layer. Yeah, I mean, so the, the, the first question of how do you reconcile the desktop or what happens on the desktop so that's indeed a problem because desktops are desktops use file systems and users are used to talking to file systems. So unless the user has an application that bridges that gap for them, either it talks directly to the object store and, or, it, or it makes the object store look like a local file system, um, then they're a little bit out of luck. Now the way we've tried to solve that problem is we've tried to do it through a web portal that just puts a that puts a hierarchical file model um, through a web server. And then you can either view individual files or you can arrange to have them copied back onto file systems. But otherwise, that's the tricky part. And that's also the distinction between in-band and out-of-band is that if you're going to live in the, in the data path, you could have some client agent. It could be as crude as a fuse driver or something. But you'd, you'd have to be in the data path presenting them with files or not. For now, I personally believe being out of data paths is better. It's compromised. It's not exactly what your user wants to see. Um, uh, but but it's, it's probably a better approach. Um, I'm sorry, and the second half of your question was again? Well, you've got your, you've got your files as they are today. Your, all of your file systems break up your file into chunks oh, sure. that are stored around. So are yeah, those no, so I think an objects? object is, a block could be an object, and a file could be an object. And, 
there are many file systems, no, I shouldn't say many, there are several that replace blocks with, with objects where they might use the hash of the block as its address. And there's a whole, tra I mean, I think all the new storage technologies coming out in the next few years will be based on that kind of concept. Now, is that any different than a traditional block and file architecture? Not really. The difference is in the addressing scheme. So blocks are generally sequentially numbered. Um, you know, storage device zero, block number one, two, three, four, five. Next comes block number one, two, three, four, five, six. But in an object, the, the address of the object could be in the eye of the beholder. It's whatever the, whoever designs the system it is. So it could be that you take an object, you hash it, you get back your SHA-256, and you fling that at the object store, and it returns to you the block that, you know, is part of your file. Okay. Right? Sure. So, so I believe that, and I believe that there, there are many file systems on the market that are based on a lot of these principles. They don't always advertise them that way. But the point I think that we're finding is, is that um, when you just build against very, very large sequential addresses, you have a lot of housekeeping to do to manage all of that. I mean, another good example are file systems like Lustre yeah. or, or Panassis, where you know, the idea there is the premise behind Lustre is that, hey, a traditional file system has two major jobs. It has to present um, a POSIX interface to me as the end user, and it has to actually provision extensive disk and actually do the disk I.O. part. Well, those are such different tasks that why not just split them into two different tasks, one that runs on this machine and one that runs on that machine. Um, and that's actually allowed Lustre to grow to tremendous scale. Um, now, Lustre doesn't use these pr the principles I described for, for fault tolerance and self-healing. They would, could, should. And I think if the Lustre mo movement had gotten more momentum or if it found its way into enterprise computing, I think you'd see third-party vendors building object stores for, lu for Lustre that have different properties that are more, you know, more akin to what I showed on the board. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Well, thanks for having me. <laughs>